Good morning, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, when Ben McKee um, handballed this job to me, because he was off overseas, he said to me, it's really simple, Nick. You just need to talk about maximum residue limits. So the first thing I'll ask is, who here knows what a maximum residue limit is? I see a couple of hands. Excellent. That's great. Uh, I better press the button to, to continue on. Before I do, though, um, when Ben contributed to my uh, presentation here, he provided one slide, this one, because he wanted to remind everybody about how many brands Hive and Wellness now owns and, and maintains, and at the fact that we're selling to 35 different countries. And people like Lindsay, for example, and anybody who's done any exporting will know just what the challenges are, because MRLs are different wherever you go. So what is a, ma a maximum residue limit? You saw in Liz's, I, I, I was very interested in one of her slides when she started talking about glyphosate free, chemical free. Anybody who's worked in this area will know what does that mean? To the layman, does it mean zero? Does it mean a certain level that you could have? Sorry, Rob. Yeah. Most people tell I've got a booming voice. Um, what does that mean? And if you look into the legalities of the Food Standard Code and in both here in Australia and overseas, you've got to be very careful when people say glyphosate free or pesticides free or chemical free. Because from the legalities perspective, what they could be saying is you are under the MRL, the maximum residue limit. So that becomes really important in understanding the labelling and exactly what you're trying to achieve. As per what you see on the board, um, MRLs are different to all, all different uh, countries. It looks about what is the concentration of the chemical in the food. So that is the food that you're selling to the consumer. This becomes particularly important later on when I start talking about you as beekeepers providing stuff to packets or whether you're selling it at the farm gate or directly to FMCG. So keep that particular in mind what your responsibilities are. Now, MRLs here in Australia are set by the Australian Veterinary and Pesticides Management Authority. They set up an MRL standard, which eventually then gets adopted by the food code, which is then eventually basically policed by your local government authority, your health inspectors. Now, what would a health inspector know about an MRL for amitraz? And I'm sure if you went back to your local councils and if they were health inspector was inspecting you because you sell honey directly to the market, ask them next time, what's the, what's the MRL for Amitraz? And whether or not they even know it. So one of the things that I've brought along today is really from a layman's term, <coughs> excuse me, is where do they come from, what do they mean, and, and how do they affect you as beekeepers and people in the industry, whether you're at the commercial scale or at the hobbyist scale, okay? So, just a quick background, people who are already um, hold food certificates in their local government areas, you will know that everything is covered by the Food Standards Code, which is a federal code. Um, you can find that online at any time. As per Liz's uh, comment before, the honey standard, you could drive four trucks through it. It's really weak. So at Hive and Wellness, we start off with a Codex Elementris on honey, but even then that is skewed more to northern hemisphere honeys. So for us, being able to talk about um, Australian honeys in particular, it becomes a real challenge. Okay, so we start off with the Food Standards Code. They then go through, uh, through the AVPMA and they create what's called the Schedule 19, Schedule 20 and Schedule 21. These are applicable in Australia only. Even though it's the Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, New Zealanders have their own schedules. And you can look these up at any time to see what the MRL is for those particular chemicals. And later on, I'll, I've just got a couple of slides that will talk about what are applicable to the apiculture industry. So for us, when we look at the MRL, the first thing you've got to ask yourself is, well, how good is the laboratory? How good is the test? Um, one of the things I really enjoyed from Liz's presentation is she's showing you fingerprint. Now, I'm a chemist by trade, 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry. So when someone tests something, the first thing I ask is, what is the efficacy of that test? Who is the laboratory? What method are they using? Because anybody could use any particular equipment or anything like that, but unless they actually know what they're doing and what the limit of quantification, how sensitive the test is, the results can be just as damaging as if they were correct. 
And that's a particular point to keep in mind with MRLs. So we always look to see when an MRL has been published, and we keep in mind MRL standards, what is the limit of quantification? Because that will tell us just how accurate the result is. We firmly believe that when the MRL standard is produced, it must be produced in line with good laboratory practice, so a registered laboratory. That's a particularly important point, especially back in 2022, when New South Wales and Australia was trying to get chemicals in for the Varroa outbreak. They got a permit. It wasn't a standard at the time. It's now a standard, but they got a permit. Permits different to standards for MRLs, just on the robustness of the good laboratory practice. So if you are in the business of wanting to bring a chemical to the table that will help with Varroa, I've also got a slide on what you have to go through to get there. And you could either go down the permit line or the standards line to be able to assist you at this time. So how do you do that? It's very simple. Here in Australia, for the last 200 odd years, we always, I won't say look for the easy path, but we're a bit probably clever, we're a bit smart. So when someone comes to us with a particular chemical that we want to use in food, the first thing we do is look elsewhere. And we look to see what other countries and what they have done already. That's the very first step. Secondly, we look at the chemistry and the manufacturing details of what's been done. You've all seen the different products that are coming out for ROA. You're going to, if you haven't seen them already, you'll see them during the conference, etc. Some of them have already been listed in the MRL standards. Some are still in permit stage. Some of them are still being... Um, going through the process of being reviewed. You have to look at the toxicology, then what is the metabolism and kinetics of that food going into a human body, and then what residues are going to be left behind. And that's when we start talking about what is going to be the maximum residue limit. Glyphosate free here in Australia, does anyone know what the MRL for glyphosate is in Australia? No? Okay, 200 parts per million. What is it in the UK? 100. So already making the claim of glyphosate free becomes a bit of a muddy area unless you understand the MRLs and what you can and cannot do. Once you've got to residuals, there's the standard OH&S, environmental requirements. What is the effect on secondary crops, which is really important to us, because whilst the glyphosate may have been used to desiccate canola, bees haven't been anywhere near that by that stage. They've got the, everything off the flower. But what is the glyphosate in the ground that then goes to the water that then the bees drink? So it becomes very important to understand that process. I will share with you only just recently, because we participated in the National Residue Survey, one of the bee our beekeepers came up with an elevated lead level, which was above the MRL in their raw material, the raw honey. Now, when the National Residue Survey in Canberra, DAF contact us and they asked for all the details in the beekeeper, we talked to the beekeeper as well, and they reached out to us for help. And they said, look, I don't understand this, Nick. We're all 304 stainless in our plant. We do not understand where this lead's come from. Because the first thing I met, first thing I thought was, yeah, I wonder if she's using an old galvanised drum. So we went and visited the beekeeper. No galvanised drums. We've known this beekeeper and the family for over 50 years. Very good plant set up, very good extraction set up. So then we looked to go out into the field. And we said, look, where was your apiary when you, you did this foraging? So we went there, and the three of us walked around in circles, and then we just get bigger and bigger and bigger. 900 metres out, we found an old dilapidated farmhouse. And that dilapidated farmhouse was an old corrugated iron tank that had collapsed, but still had about three foot of water. Now, this beekeeper had already taken their apiary away. They were back at another apiary site, nearly um, 480 k's away. I grabbed some of the water out of that tank because I could see a lot of feral bees drinking. It was about 10.30 in the morning on a nice warm, about 18 degree day. Went back, bingo, guess where the lead had come from. And in that particular interest, in our situation, what can we do to help the beekeepers? Well, we've sought legal advice and we've had from this. We are allowed to dilute that honey down to bring it below the MRL. Okay? So if you are a beekeeper supplying to us and you have this sort of situation, come and talk to us. There are legal pathways forward. If you are a beekeeper who's selling by yourself, have a look into what these sort of uh, um, implications are, because you can't sell it as it is above the MRL. But if you have methodologies to use other honey to then bring it below it, they are pathways for you. And then finally, we're also um, very new to um, the APVMA, is gene technology and nanotechnology, it's trying to keep up with what's going on with the rest of the world. So here are some quick MRLs that are relevant in uh, agriculture. 
Tutin, Tutin, particularly for our New Zealand friends, um, for those that uh, know anything about Tutin. Amatraz, you'll then start to see some of those lovely uh, Varroa uh, chemicals that we're getting into, fipronil, flumethrin, flavanate, glucose, uh, glyphosate, as I said, 0.2. Um, oxytetracycline, here in Australia it's 0.3, in the UK it's 0.1. So it's really important to understand that. It's really important if you supply to us, please tell us if you use an OTC. I have had an incident in the last three years where a beekeeper forgot to tell us that he delivered us a, some material that he had been feeding OTC. Um, and it becomes rather embarrassing when you start breaching importation requirements and things like that. And of course, also in phosphine, which some of them might use for, for fumigation, etc. One of the questions we always ask people is, and, and try to help, we, we get this a lot from the, the, um, the, the, the consumer is, um, why is there lead or zinc in my honey? Why, why, why is it in there? Well, there's actually MRLs for those heavy metals in foods. What can sometimes be a bit confusing though is, if you go to the schedules and you do a search for honey, especially in schedule 19, you won't see honey because Schedule 19 opens up with the basics and, and gen, gen, general items for food. And because you're selling it as a food, you need to comply with that as well. Jump into Schedule 20 and 21, etc. then you start seeing the specifics for honey. And you'll find chemicals, the APVMA have listed, and what is those limits for honey. And you'll find out all the other limits for all the other foods, because sometimes they could be higher. So it's really important if you want to try and sell your product and say glyphosate free, chemical free, pesticides free, insecticides free, read those schedules, okay, and what are the legal uh, implications and what you need to be able to have. So as I said, we participate in the National Residue Survey. Um, we provide um, upwards of 100 samples for free every year to uh, Canberra. They go through the testing and test it themselves at their own laboratories. They share those results in the National Residue Survey um, report each year. I'm not saying this because I'm a chemical nerd. It is a great read. It's really interesting, especially for the common consumer, because a lot of people get sucked in by that, I'm free, free this, free that. Sorry, if it's under the MRL, it's acceptable. And just to finish up, because I know we all want to get to that um, morning tea, um, just a few thoughts about, as you know, there's a thousand funny bee memes here. Um, I like to call myself a um, hopeless beekeeper. Um, I took over my dad's apiary many years ago as a hobbyist, and not a day goes by where I don't get stung or do something wrong. Um, usually one of the, the local beekeepers will drive by and they'll see JO44 on a hive and go, Nick, you're facing it the wrong way. The water's flowing in through the front door. Do you want to just turn your hive a little bit? So, look, thank you very much. If you have any questions on MRLs in particular and want to expand more, feel free to grab me during one of the breaks and um, we can have a chat about how they affect you and whether or not maybe you're someone who's got a, a new solution for some of the varroa mite ideas and uh, you've got a chemical or something you might like to try out. Thank you very much.